it's supposed to be a brother slash sisterhood when you join law enforcement. They want you to feel as a family. That's what they're trying to get across to you. And that starts from day one in the academy. Welcome to Insider Career Conversations. I'm your host, Sylvia Juarez. As an education and higher ed advocate, I'm dedicated to informing different communities about college readiness and admissions. I'm finding that more and more individuals are interested in non-traditional career paths. This sometimes leads to conversations about career options that aren't in the mainstream or obvious. Insider Career Conversations explores how to get into these niche fields, what trainings and education is needed, and other requirements that can make for a successful career. This season's conversation focuses on law enforcement through community engagement and educational opportunities. My co-host is retired officer Benny Green. Benny and I have partnered to enrich college and career days at middle schools. Our goal has always been to inspire students to explore how law enforcement might be a career for them. Benny, thank you so much for being with me. Uh, you are a long time friend. I consider you a long time friend. Uh, we've had the opportunity to work together in some career fairs and different field trips that I've taken to the campus that you formerly worked with. And I am super excited to have you on my co-host this season of Insider Career Conversations at Law Enforcement. I think you get what I have been trying to do for students and them seeing different careers. So I really appreciate you being part of this podcast this season and bringing your colleagues to talk about their position. I want to make sure that students not only understand their education path, but also some of the careers that they want to get into. I'm really excited about having you here this season. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And like you said, I consider you a friend as well. And uh, we've been able to work with each other for the last few years. And uh, it's been a rewarding yet. It's also been an opportunity for me to reach out to not only just do my regular law enforcement type activities of my career, my job, my field, but also to reach out to the youth. That that's something that's very important to me. To start, I would say that, um, well, once again, as you all know, my name is uh, Benny Green, retired officer. But uh, prior to getting law enforcement, uh, I'll go a little further back into um, how things kind of began with myself. I uh, grew up in uh, Watts and uh, Compton and went to school in uh, Downey and Norwalk areas. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew I needed to do something, you know, but I wasn't sure. One of my things I wanted to do was be an NBA, a professional basketball player. I happened to be really good at it. So I figured, well, why not do this? It's something that's fun and makes a lot of money. And in my, in my mind said, man, I'll, and I'll just be rich. <laughs> However, like I said, I was really, really good, but reality set in and that wasn't going to happen. So I had to come up with a real career and I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But as I went on, I knew I needed to go to school. So I went to a, see, that would be Long Beach City Community College. And I took classes here and there just to try to um, figure out what I want to do, what's, what would spark my interest. And after uh, leaving there, because it was more like a social gathering as opposed to going to school because we all knew each other, I transferred to Cerritos College. And when I got to Cerritos, I was still kind of unsure what I wanted to do. And I had a professor there, a history professor, and he grabbed my attention. I, it was like when I would go to class, I couldn't wait to go to class because it was like going to um, church almost, if you will, for not being sacrilegious. Just the fact that this guy just captured my attention like no other. Now, mind you, I'd always, always had been his, interested in history and political science and things of that nature, but he just, just put on the table. And, it, and, and my mind opened up and I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be a teacher. When you got to Cerritos College, because you actually decided that Long Beach was not the place for you because it was more social gathering, was more of, you know, continuation of high school, if you will, and making that determination of one community college and going to another, what led to that? Because you could have easily just continued to have some fun, I'm assuming, you know, still chop it up with your friends and, and do what you needed to do with them. But at the same time, how did you say, okay, if I'm really getting to be serious about my future, young Benny Green decided what? Well, a couple of things. Number one, also, when I realized that the NBA was not going to happen, I'm like 19, 20 years old. I was also trying to get into the rap game. That's when it was really new back then. We're talking 1985, 84, 85-ish. So 
that was working out, but but it wasn't working out to the level that I needed to really make make it. So I was coming to the realization that that wasn't going to happen either. So the window was narrow, and I did I, I wanted to put that in there. So that's another reason why I left Long Beach City, and, and I was into that kind of uh, vibe and that kind of uh, people I kind of hung out with, if you will. Also, my girlfriend at the time was like, okay. We both went to Long Beach City and she said, we need to get out of here and we need to get serious. So we went to Cerritos. We both went to Cerritos. She was ahead of me in her curriculum. So she transferred to uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills. And then um, a year or two later, I did the same thing. And like I said, I wanted to be a teacher. So I graduated from Cal State Dominguez Hills, went and um, to their teaching credential program and was able to teach a little bit at uh, Long Beach Millican. So now you're about to finish your teaching credential, and then what happens? Well, basically, so I was working uh, I was working from like 6 or 6, six at night to approximately 1 in the morning. And then um, after I would get off work, I would drive home, which was about a 45-minute drive, and I'd sleep for maybe three and a half hours if I was lucky. And then I'd get up and I'd go teach classes at Long Beach Millican. And I had three classes to teach there. Well, while you're working on your teacher credential, you also have to go to school and you also have to prepare lesson plans. So in other words, I didn't sleep very often. Just put it that way. And so um, one night I was coming home and let me back up just before I say this. My wife, who the, the girl who was with me at uh, Long Beach City and in Cerritos and then uh, Cal State Dominguez, we ended up getting married. She became my wife. My wife's now, I'm, I'm working on my teaching credential. She's pregnant on maternity leave. And I'm, I'm driving home and I uh, fell asleep on the freeway and I hit a diesel, a semi truck. Uh, luckily, I didn't get hurt, but I really damaged my vehicle. So I got home about 30 minutes late and my wife was already waiting for me with the, um, I opened up the garage and the door was open already. And she saw the vehicle and obviously she got upset and she obviously had an accident. And I explained to her, I fell asleep. And she says, well, something has to give. You can't keep doing this. Now, mind you, I'm in my last semester because I'm about getting ready to get my teacher redemption. And she goes, something has to give. So why don't you just go ahead, stop working and just concentrate solely on your teacher potential? Well, me being, I guess, for lack of sounding a certain way, like a male, not a male show, but trying to sound like the man. I said, no, I need to continue to make money. So I stopped teaching and I stopped the program in my last semester. And said, hey, I got to, I got to go ahead and, um, you know, make money. So after that, I returned to my job instead of working part-time, I went back full-time, the same company, just in a different position. And I'm working full-time and I'm working graveyards now. And I'm watching TV, and one of the things I always thought about being in the back of my mind was a police officer. Uh, I have family members that are in law enforcement, not a lot, but some, and, and I never really talked to them about their, their jobs, but I, I kind of had that in the back of my mind. So I'm watching um, a television show every night at work, and it's um, it, was, it was called LAPD Life on the Beat. And I was watching, and I said, you know what? I can do that. I really can do that. So one thing led to another. I went down and tested, passed the test, did the other psychological tests and everything that goes along with that, and physical fitness and et cetera, and uh, entered the academy. And then I went to the academy and I graduated. So I guess this would be one of those like off, what is it, life altering moments when, thank God, you just had an accident and it wasn't more than just than that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your wife is fantastic for kind of putting it in perspective. You can't do two things at once. You need to kind of focus, right? And how was it? Because at least what you shared with me when you started LAPD, you went back home, quote unquote, to Watts. And how was that homecoming as someone who sometimes isn't always seen as the most positive individual in the community? Well, because everyone knew who, I, not everyone, but a lot of people that I came in contact with they knew me or they knew they knew me as a as a youth. So they knew my values, my core and who I was. I had always had good intentions, always put it that way. And so I had their trust, if you will, because they knew me prior. 
and they knew that I wouldn't let anything change me to not be the person that they knew me to be. Right. It's almost you like know. you had a dual vision, like you had a dual responsibility to not only the community, but also to now the job that you had. Would you consider it that way? To a point, yes, because, you know, it's a brother. It's supposed to be a brother slash sisterhood when you join law enforcement. And that's not to say that um, there's any negative things going on, even though we all know there are at times. But that's not to say that. It's just that they want you to feel as a family. That's what they're trying to get across to you. And that starts from day one in the academy. And I'm only speaking for LAPD because that's the only academy that I went through 20 plus years ago. So it was a, uh, they wanted to make it a family dynamic, if you will. So you have that aspect of it. But then for me, I have the commitment to my community. Now, that commitment consists of not letting bad people, if there are bad people off the hook or letting them go. It doesn't mean that, but it means that I'm, on, I'm not here just to enforce the law. I'm here to help you in other ways if possible, if that makes sense. Right. No, it's, it makes perfect sense. I guess that's what I'm, I'd like to point out, that if you're an individual that can carry that type of commitment, right? Because it is a commitment to understand what your profession is taking you into, but how you're going to do it. And I think often we hear about the negative aspect of any career, law enforcement more so than, than perhaps others, but we don't often talk about how important it is for us to carry our own values into that career. And you did that with an understanding that this was going to be a homecoming to you in the sense that you were going to engage with those individuals who knew you, who knew how you interacted with the neighborhood at large, but also knew that they trusted you enough to know that you were going to get the job done. Your job was to be a policeman. And that that's important. Going back to the academy, I'm now taking into consideration that we have academies at community colleges. We have academies that stand alone. When we're talking about police academies and they're being brought in to start sharing a certain mindset, in your opinion, how can a person who's joining the academy also infuse who they are at that time? Do they lose an identity? Do they lose a part of themselves? Or is there an opportunity to also engage a part of who you are into that experience? That's going to depend on you as an individual, in my opinion. I went in the academy in my early 30s. There's no breaking. There's no molding. There's not. I'm, I'm already past that. I'm not, you know, I'm not 20 and a half or 21 or 22. And even if I was, I wasn't like that then. Now, if you notice when you look at academies, look at all the men and all the women. The men are all generally have bald heads. They have the names on the back of their shirts and they have on the same color shirts and the same color uh, pants or sweats. The women the same way and their hair in a bun because you want no one. We're all the same. Is That's the mindset. It's kind of like um, and I'm not saying that's bad at all because you need to be a, you need to have a, a like mindset in a lot of ways. Tactically speaking, communication amongst each other. You need to be on the same page, especially in stressful situations. So that's a good thing what they're doing. I'm not knocking that at all. But I was able to learn that, yet I'm still me, 100%. And mind you, I was older than some of my instructors, you know, so it was different. And I had a different um, relationship with them, if you will, a lot of times. Right. So, and I knew the areas especially the inner city, the, the, the um, South Central areas, better than they did. And they worked there. But I knew it better than them because I lived there. They just worked there. And, you know, right. and now they're yeah. academy instructors. It depends on the individual. Right. And I think, Benny, one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about right now as you're talking about, you know, going into the academy and kind of providing that uniform population, if you will, I think of it because in my 20s, I went into corporate America. And there, it was a certain way that you had to dress. There's a certain way that you had to behave. There's a certain way that you had to express yourself that um, in some cases was like kind of a, a boot camp to the white collar work that's done in the U.S., right? You had to, you, mm -hmm. I stood out. I was a Latina in a white male dominated community. And then I eventually got into compliance. So where now I'm telling them what they're doing should not be done in that way. So who am I at 20? 
and to be mm-hmm. different, look different, and I'm a female, I'm telling them how they need to behave or they need to interact or they need to do now. And I get, I'm pointing that out because there's different professions that whether it's understood or not, you have to assimilate to a certain degree physically to what you have to get into. It's not just one community or one profession, right? To a certain extent, you have to do that depending on where you go. But we're now at a point in this generation where individuality is so important to really manifest, whether it's your interests or whether it's your identity or whatever it is, individuality is now being promoted more. So as you now have exited law enforcement, have you seen an opportunity for that to really happen in terms of individuality? How do you think the current opportunities out there for that person that walks into the police academy can eventually have an identity that's their own within something that's very structured? To my knowledge, that's going to be still difficult, especially due to the fact, once again, like I said, that's why everybody is uniformed because you don't, you're not supposed to stick out. And if you do stick out, it's for something that you do well. You're a seriously fast runner. You can do an extraordinary amount of push-ups, whatever it may be, or something positive, but you don't stick out. So in other words, and I'll use this for example, sometimes you see um, people who like to maybe have different color hair. Maybe it's purple or it's green or whatever, and that's fine, whatever. But in something like an academy, that's not going to fly. You can't. So you kind of give up certain things like that, knowing when you go in, that's what you have to do. Now, once you graduate, you get willed out to whatever uh, station you're going to work at, and then you make probation and you get willed out to another one. You can try to form your own individuality in a sense of, I'm going to be the kind of patrol officer who gets out of his car. I'm going to go talk to the shopkeepers. They're going to know. I'm going to find the crime trends. When I get out, everybody's going to know who I am. I'm going to make sure that not just knowing who I am just because I'm your local police officer, but knowing that I actually care about you and your business or that you just happen to live here, whatever the case may be. Or you're just driving through the city and I happen to pull you over. So you can do that on calls. You handle them the way they, you never, you never compromise safety, but you can always talk to people a certain way and show that you care and, right. and give them the resources that they need to whatever situation they're dealing with. So now we have young officer Benny Green doing his thing in LAPD. So how did the Orange County Probation Department come in? Because I think I shared with you that in what I know, it's an interesting cross to go from police officer to a probation officer. Correct. Well, it happens. But usually what you'll find is when officers normally what they'll do is they'll go from one department to another department. And they'll normally do it after they get vested or they retire from one and then they'll go into another one. And often it has to do with different uh, retirement systems. And in your case, with an associate's and a bachelor's, were your strides more solid economically or would they have been the same for someone that didn't go the education route? Well, when it came down, now this is when I came through. And this is, like I said, once again, L.A., a high school diploma will suffice. But it's like anything else in life. Whomever's looking at those uh, resumes and those applications, they're reading them. And if that's going to help get you a boost or not, that's what's going to help get you a boost or not. And if you have that education level, it's going to make the academy a lot easier when it comes down to the knowledge base that you need to learn. And once you graduate the academy, all that knowledge that you learn is going to be mush practically when you get out there in the field because you're going to have to put all that together and unstress, and in certain cases, extreme stress. Can you tell us a little bit about the transition from working with agencies that are more city or state, and then making a crossover into a system police department? Well, when you work with somewhere like a large agency like LAPD and things like that, who have, you know, eight, nine, 10,000 people, (laughs) it's a little different in the sense of when you want to promote or things like that, you're going against potentially hundreds of people. You know, it's it's different. Not that you don't believe you can do things. It's just that it's just different. The chief doesn't know who you are. 
No, nobody in brass know who you are unless you know unless you're part of brass, meaning management. When you get to a place like the UC where I was, the chief not only knows your name, they know your children's name. They know maybe who your favorite football team is. They just know these things because you have interaction with them because it's a smaller department. You're talking nine, ten thousand officers. Now you're talking fifty. So now people know each other, which is good and bad, but overall good. But yes, that was part of the transition going from that, from LA to Orange County to finally get to the UC. And it is a big difference because at the UC, since you, the chief knows you and you see him or her on a daily basis, generally speaking, and everyone on down, they know your work. They can easily log in and say, here it is. Wow, bam. You know, this is what this officer, Officer Green did today or last week. This is the rest he made because they can just log in and read the reports. Right. No chief generally at a large organization does that unless it's something that's not going over well. <laughs> but other than that, mm -hmm. my chief could do these things and actually literally call me on the phone, have my number. So it's great in that sense. And, and, and people can see your work. So when you're ready to promote it, you're ready to do things, or you have ideas and they make sense and it's good for the community, it's good for the department, and it's good for you. It's a win, win, win. Let's make it happen. I like what you're saying because it's also important for anyone who's looking for a profession to also be able to understand how to get not only the promotions, but also get your ideas that may be new, that may lead to a promotion, but at the time could be just a new idea to the company, to the organization. And you did that with the community engagement office officer position. Can you tell us about how you created that within your position? Well, real quickly, what happened is approximately five years ago or so, I was on one of my days off. And um, there was at this particular time, a lot of officer involved shootings had kind of really start being really publicized on, on the diff various news channels and things of that nature across the country, uh, different uh, shootings that was being involved. and. It seemed like every day it was a new one. Sometimes in days it was multiples on the same day. And I'm thinking to myself, we have got to as law enforcement officers, not necessarily at where I work, as far as the, the shootings and things like that, that wasn't happening. But as the things were happening across the country, it was affecting where I worked as well, as far as the way we were being looked at. And the, um, the attitudes of the citizenry, some started to change. So I was like, okay, how can I make it better where I work, even though these things, thank God, aren't happening where I am, but other things are happening. How can I forge a better union or a working relationship with the community that we serve? So I came up with this idea and I wrote, some, jotted down some notes and I passed it on to my patrol lieutenant at the time. He looked at it and he said, you know what? I like this idea. Do you mind if I go show it to the chief at the time? And I said, sure. He goes and so to the chief at the time. Chief goes, wow, I like this. Tell him to make me a PowerPoint. And he has to sell it to the management or what I call brass. I made a PowerPoint of what I thought we should do and how we could do it, et cetera, et cetera. They said, we really like this. Now you have to sell it to the, the community at large. So all the, for lack of a better term, the um, people that were um, had held high positions throughout the community, they had a meeting which I was invited to, and they loved it. So then after that, I had to write the whole thing. Got the position ready, everything's a go. It got budgeted, everything was good to go. But because we're a union, I had to act, they have to actually put the position out for anybody to apply for it. So the job that I created from A to Z, I had to actually interview for. <laughs> Imagine that. And that's often what happens, right? Is that we create an opportunity and we, we create it around our thoughts, but then we have to open it to everyone, right? We have to open the opportunity for everyone to be a part of it. And obviously we know that you got the job. I think this brings us to full circle of when you and I met and you were out helping me to give a different impression, let's say to middle school and high school kids. So I can attest to the fact that you really turned this position into a community engagement opportunity. I really appreciate you taking the time to give another perspective of what law enforcement could be. I'm excited about the colleagues that you've invited and some of the conversations that we can have with them about this position. And thank you so much, Benny, for making the time. I really can't thank you enough. It was my pleasure. 
I would just like to say one thing is none of this happens, though, without the backing of management. And where I work, I was fortunate enough and the colleagues, my other my older colleagues that are going to come on. It's the backing of management in this area that allows that to happen. And that's that's a big part of their mindset, too. Right. It's changing. It is. Um, I think you've made a big impact where you've been in the different agencies. So thank you for doing that, Benny. Thank you so much. And once again, thank you for having me on. And I look forward to the next episodes. And I'm really excited about it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, till next time. Stay tuned for more insider career conversations that showcase career paths within law enforcement. We appreciate you listening and look forward to next time. Insider Career Conversations is a production of Juarez Consulting. For more information, you can visit JuarezConsultingInc.com. This episode was produced by Silvia Juarez Magana, with production help and editing by Casmara Hall.